Hey everyone, welcome to the Being Patient Podcast. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. When my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I decided to use my skills as a journalist in a different way. Frustrated by the lack of information on science and the inability to get different expert opinions, I decided to quit my job at the Wall Street Journal to create a better platform for people impacted by dementia. We are a community where news and information is created by our team of journalists. We ask tough questions and we simplify the science so that anyone can understand. We don't only cover disease, but delve into the latest research on what it takes to keep our brains healthy. We invite the experts and ask your questions. Here's today's podcast. I hope you enjoy it. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Genevieve Glass. I am a reporter here at Being Patient. And today we are joined by Dr. Michael Geschwind, who is the professor of neurology and at the Memory and Aging Center at um, University of California, San Francisco. And we are going to be talking about rapidly progressive dementias um, or otherwise known as RPD. So they're dementias that you know, progress quickly, typically over the course of, you know, weeks to months, but sometimes it could be a couple of years. Um, and I think it's something that isn't talked about as much as dementia or Alzheimer's because it's not as prevalent. It's actually quite rare and it can be difficult to diagnose. So we are going to dive in um, with him. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Great. Um, I just want to make sure that people can see you here. Hold on just one second. There we go. Okay, great. So I guess firstly, I'd like to start with, you know, in your own words, what are rapidly progressive dementias? Yes, Deborah, it's a great question. So there is no set definition for a rapidly progressive dementia or RPD, as you noted. I usually use the definition of a person going from normal cognition to dementia in less than two years. And usually it's much less than that. Usually it's less than a year. And usually it's on the matter, it's a matter of weeks to months from normal cognitive function to dementia. And then I define dementia as somebody who's impaired in one or more cognitive domains. Cognitive domains could be memory, language, visual spatial function, um, executive function, organizing, planning, multitasking, um, any of those domains sufficient that it, they can no longer function the way they could prior to the onset of the condition. So there has to be functional impairment uh, due to cognitive dysfunction. And usually it occurs over weeks to months, um, but I extend it up to two years. And one of the reasons I use the two-year cutoff is that prion diseases, which we'll talk about later, are probably the prototypical form of rapidly progressive dementia. And although most of them most of the patients with prion disease survive. The total survival is less than a year from onset, let alone onset to dementia, which is much shorter. We do have patients who sometimes have a slower course of prion disease, and they may not develop full dementia until up to two years or sometimes even longer. So I wanted to capture that, that group. Uh, but the vast majority of RPDs, we're usually talking about somebody who has less than a year from onset of symptoms to development of functional impairment due to cognitive dysfunction. Understood. Well, that was a great, um, that was a great kind of overall view. Thank you. So what would you say is the overall prevalence um, of RPD in the U.S.? Unknown. At our center, uh, we're a center specializing in cognitive impairment, dementia. We also see a lot of movement disorders usually associated with cognitive impairment, we found that about 2.5 to 3, somewhere between 2 and 3% of all the cases referred to us with cognitive impairment, 2 to 3% of them 
were actually rapidly progressive. Wow, okay. And why, um, this is a question that we just got, but why does it progress so quickly? Yes, that's a great question. And it's sort of, it's sort of the answer is sort of a reverse. It's, it's the types of conditions that cause rapidly progressive dementia that explain why they present more rapidly. So um, I hope I'm not skipping ahead too much, but I tend to categorize rapidly progressive dementias into different ideologies, different causes based on uh, underlying cause or pathology. So I use a mnemonic to help me think through all the different possible causes. And the mnemonic I like is one called vitamins, where each letter of the word vitamins refers to a different ideologic cause. So V for vascular, I for, uh, and vascular could be strokes, uh, vasculitis where you have inflammation of the blood vessels, um, sort of any uh, um, cl blood clots, like we're in COVID now, and you know there are patients who are developing blood clots in the brain, and that would be a cause. So a, a thrombosis, a clotting, abnormal clotting of the blood in the sagittal uh, vein. Apologies, that was my phone. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, a, a clotting of the blood vessels in the brain can be caused by, in this case, post uh, from COVID itself, possibly from vaccination. Um, so medication sometimes can do it. Uh, certain um, bodily states like pregnancy can lead to hypercoagulation. Cancer can lead to hypercoagulation or increased clotting. So those are for some vascular causes. I for infectious, I won't go through all those. COVID-19, the coronavirus uh, would be uh, one possible example. Usually the um, COVID-19 doesn't directly affect the brain. Uh, it's very, very rare that they found the virus in the brain. Uh, very rare. It, it's usually through secondary effects that you get neurologic involvement. But um, herpes encephalitis, Lyme disease, uh, HIV, all of those can uh, affect the brain. And then wow. the T would be for toxic metabolic. So vitamin excess, vitamin deficiencies, um, disorders of nutrition can sometimes lead to that. So that would be a metabolic, uh, different drugs of abuse, different drugs of not abuse, but drugs that you're given to treat something sometimes have side effects. Um, so that those would be toxic effects. Um, and then the next, um, so you have, V-I-T-A, uh, the A is for, I use for autoimmune, usually antibody mediated ideologies. Um, and sometimes these antibodies occur spontaneously. Sometimes they're the body's reaction to fighting off a cancer. And those antibodies accidentally cross react, not only attacking the cancer, but also attacking the brain or the nervous system. And then uh, next would be M. I use M for a couple of things, mitochondrial disease. The mitochondria are the energy or the building blocks of the cell. And the uh, disorders of mitochondria, often through genetic mutations in the one's mitochondrial DNA or one's regular nuclear DNA. There, we have two different sources of main DNA in the body. One, the ones we normally think of, the Human Genome Project, is looking at cellular DNA. But within each cell, there are these energy um, producers of the cell, these organelles called mitochondria, which originally, um, historically, came from bacteria. Uh, and when we were much smaller organisms, mitochondria evolved and became part of the cell. And those have their own DNA. And sometimes D mitochondrial DNA itself um, can lead to neurologic disease. Uh, and then metastases, if somebody has a cancer and it spreads sometimes to the brain, that would be another M for the, uh, in the vitamins mnemonic. And then uh, another I um, for the in vitamins is iatrogenic. So usually caused by medical intervention. Usually it's medications that cause it, 
chemotherapy, for example, can sometimes have side effects that can lead to rapidly progressive dementia, radiation therapy um, as well. And then the next is neurodegenerative, and for I'll use it for neurodegenerative, for neoplasm, uh, being uh, neoplasm being cancer, either directly invading the brain or affecting the brain, or through maybe an antibody mediated process. And then the last letter of the S, I use for a couple of things seizures. So sometimes patients can have seizures and they're non motor seizures, so they're not obvious. Uh, maybe to a trained clinician, they might see a little bit of twitching. The patient is, stares off into space, isn't really aware, isn't communicating, and we'll see a little bit of twitching at one corner of the mouth. And that could indicate that there's a non-motor seizure going on that's affecting the patient's awareness and cognition. Um, and then the other thing that S can be would be systemic disease, sometimes autoimmune, rheumatologic, cardiac diseases, uh, diseases of the liver, uh, systemic diseases can lead to dysfunction in the brain. Often it might be through a metabolic toxic process, sometimes through other processes. And then the other thing I use for S are structural. So sometimes there can be structural changes in the brain, such as maybe a mass, maybe a tumor, maybe not a tumor, such as a cyst that actually are interfering with the flow of spinal fluid or are growing large and impinging on part of the brain. Um, sometimes one can have a leak of the spinal fluid, uh, a, a CSF leak. Um, that can often happen through somebody who uh, overexerts themselves or, selves or has trauma. And that CSF leak can cause the brain to sink because the spinal fluid that's bu buoying the brain and keeping it up there floating, um, if that spinal fluid leaks, the brain can sag and it pulls down on the veins and the nerves that are connected to the brain and, and it can compress the, um, the top of the spinal cord, the brainstem, and all those things can lead to the brain not working properly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can be a form of rapidly progressive dementia. So um, I don't even remember what the initial question was. But, <laughs> no, um, no, no, you, an you kind of, you answered it. So, I mean, kind of, you know, now thinking about what you just said, what are, what are the symptoms? Are they similar to Alzheimer's and dementia? What are the commonalities and differences? Great question. So I, I would think of it as a Venn diagram uh, where you have two circles overlapping and the overlap would be extraordinary. So the symptoms alone don't usually differentiate rapidly progressive dementia from other dementias. It's the time course. It's the time course of the presentation of those symptoms. So all the symptoms you see in a slower dementia, an Alzheimer's disease, where you have episodic memory loss and later on in the disease, long uh, distant memory loss, long-term long memory loss, uh, Parkinson's disease, where you have motor dysfunction, uh, frontal terminal dementia, where you have a lot of behavior, personality changes, um, uh, Huntington's disease, where you have uh, abnormal increased movements, as opposed to Parkinson's, where you have slow movements. In Huntington's, you often have increased excess movements, fast movements. All of these things can occur in rapidly progressive dementia, but the time course, the evolution of the onset of these symptoms is faster. And that's usually what would tell somebody, this isn't a normal dementia, this is rapidly progressive. And it's important to know that because there is, like that Venn diagram, there's a similar workup or differential, but there are things that normally you wouldn't think of for a slow dementia. Right. So for instance, um, somebody has a lot of strokes um, or has inflammation in the brain causing strokes, that could lead to a rapid dementia. Uh, if somebody has uh, a, a clot in the in the brain and the sinuses that drain the blood from the brain that can lead lead to rapidly progressive dementia, um, but not usually a slower dementia. Usually, it would be more quicker onset. Sometimes you have something called a, a fistula. It's where two sources um, that normally are kept separate in the brain, uh, usually liquid sources, uh, um, but two areas that are usually separate. A fistula. Um, abnormally connects them. So a fistula would be 
you have the veins and the arteries are separate, but sometimes those veins and arteries can abnormally be fused together and you have the venous blood and the arterial blood mixing, and that could lead to problems, particularly if it's in the, in the brain. Um, yeah. So kind of going off of that, I mean, you, you've given, you know, a large array of ways that rapidly dement progressive dementia can occur. Is there a way that you can rapidly, you know, reverse symptoms um, right. if yeah. you catch them early? And that's why that question is so important because that's what sometimes differentiates RPD from regular dementia. Many of the RPDs, not all of them, many of them are completely reversible or at least treatable, if not, you know, some are curable and some are just where some you can at least stop it from progressing. So, um, and it really depends on, on the category. So the vascular causes, um, if there are strokes, you can intervene to stop the strokes. Some of the damage might be done. It might be hard to recover from. If it's a clot in the brain, if you catch it early enough, those are usually 100% curable and reversible. Um, if you have inflammation of the vessels in the brain, often very reversible. Autoimmune causes, depending on the type of antibody and whether there's a cancer associated with it or not, those can be highly treatable, very curable, um, and even if not curable, a, a long life. Somebody can have a long life if you treat it effectively. Common things being common, one of the most common causes of rapidly progressive dementia are atypical presentations of other neurodegenerative diseases. So that's that N in vitamins. That's one of the N, uh, um, one of the terms you can use for the N. And that would be other neurodegenerative diseases. So Alzheimer's disease rarely presents as rapidly progressive dementia, but Alzheimer's is really common. So it's pretty, uh, so if you look at the numbers of um, patients who have an atypical, atypically fast presentation of Alzheimer's, that would be a large portion of RPD because Alzheimer's is so common, even though you know, if we have 5 million patients with Alzheimer's disease, if you're talking a small percentage of that, or even a fraction of percent, that's still a lot of patients with a rapid form of Alzheimer's disease every year in the United States. So atypical presentation of a normally or typically slower dementia would be a pretty common cause. Now those, we don't have any treatments for those neurodegenerative diseases. Prion disease, CJD, that's also a neurodegenerative disease. Some people class it as an infectious because it is transmissible, but it's not transmissible. Uh, it's very hard to transmit. You have to take the abnormal protein uh, from one person's brain, essentially put it into another's, usually through a neurosurgical procedure or other type of uh, transplant procedure, which is uncommon. Um, so it's not infectious like COVID. Um, or uh, HIV by blood or hepatitis by blood, it's much harder to transmit. But those neurodegenerative diseases, we don't have any cures for any of them right now. We're getting there, but none of them are curative. Right. But it still would help us to know that this patient has a neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's or CJD or Parkinson's, because then we can at least put them into the right treatment trial and we can help prognosticate. We can help the physician, the family, the patient know what their expected time course might be, what medications might help, what to expect over time, and how to alleviate the symptoms that arise. Yeah, and, and so kind of going off of that, um, you know, what, what is the most common type of RPD? It depends on geography to some extent. So uh, we've published papers on this and I've published uh, papers where I have charts of looking at different cohorts of RPD from around the world. And one thing that we noticed is that, uh, well, two things, geography and time. So over the past 10 to 20 years, there's been a huge increase in our awareness of these autoimmune antibody mediated causes of rapidly progressive dementia. 
uh, the laboratories of, of Joseph Dalmo at Penn in Barcelona, Angela Vincent, Sarah Sharani at Oxford, Sean Pidock, Van der Lennon, and colleagues at Mayo. These three centers have really changed our understanding, expanded our understanding of autoimmune antibody causes of dementia or encephalopathy. And um, if you look at more recent studies, therefore, autoimmune is much higher than even sometimes neurodegenerative disease. If you look at the lesser developed world, um, such countries, maybe in Brazil, India, they published some very nice cohorts of rapidly progressive dementia. And in their studies, infection is, is among the highest, whereas in the uh, European, uh, North American studies, uh, infection is much lower uh, cause of RPD. So geography and time has, has changed those. But I would say the most common causes would be neuro other neurodegenerative diseases, autoimmune, uh, infection in the, in the developing world. Um, prion disease would certainly be the highest in most of the developing, uh, in the developed world. Um, Europe, North America, um, um, Asia, most of many parts of Asia, um, uh, Oceania, uh, those areas, uh, CJD would still be among the highest. And what are the symptoms of um, prions? Uh, prion disease, I call it the great mimicker because CJD or Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which is the predominant form of human prion disease, can look like anything. The, um, the parts of many different parts of the brain can be involved. And depending upon where the disease starts, that's how the patient may present. If the disease starts in the visual processes in parts of the brain, the patient might have visual symptoms. If it starts in the hippocampus, they might have short-term memory problems. If it starts in the parietal lobe, particularly the right parietal, they might have visual spatial processing problems. Um, if it starts in the frontal lobes, they might have behavior, personality, um, executive function changes. Um, if it starts in the cerebellum or areas of the brain that have connections to the cerebellum, they might have uncoordination, ataxia of limbs or, or the body or gait. Um, so it's really the great mimicker. Um, I had one patient who her first symptom was complaining that she lost her own autobiographical memory. She couldn't remember parts of her own life. And uh, this was 20 years ago. And she went right to the psych psychiatric ward. And then about a week later, she started to develop other symptoms that made us realize this was a neurologic problem, not psychiatric. And at that point, we did a brain MRI and we saw the classic features for Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And we had our diagnosis. And unfortunately, she died within a few weeks uh, and her autopsy showed prion disease, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Wow. So what is the you know, what is the overall, when, from diagnosis, what is the overall um, lifespan? Well, it's very varied. So yeah, I feel, like, I feel uh, like all of this is so variable. Yeah, so, yeah. well, let's talk CJD, for example. Yeah. The shortest I've seen is two weeks from onset to death. Oh um, um, I've followed other patients for eight years with CJD. Now, the last probably six years of their life was in a, pretty much a persistent vegetative state. They really, it wasn't a quality of life, but it took two years to get to the point where they were at that. So um, I had a patient who we diagnosed him two years into his illness. He had a primary, a language disorder and not much else. And uh, he ended up living for another whole year. Three years into his course, he was still driving. I'd taken away his license, but he was still driving. Um, and then he had a rapidly progressive decline after that at the three-year time point and passed away two weeks later. Um, oh. So the, the course can be quite varied. Typically for CJD in the literature, the median survival is about four to seven months. So about half the patients will live less than that, half will live longer than that. 90% of patients in the literature live less than a year. In my own cohort, I find it's a little longer, about 
most patients will live up 90% probably would be less than a year and a half. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's pretty shocking. It's quick. It can be yeah. very quick. And that's why it's really important to make a diagnosis quickly and correctly, because you don't want to give somebody a, the wrong diagnosis if it's, um, if it's, if it's in fact something treatable or reversible if you catch it quickly enough. Um, so you don't want to tell somebody they have CJD when they have a treatable autoimmune disorder, which is why there are things that can help us differentiate between these um, diseases. So uh, it takes clinical experience, but often we can tell there are certain features that are more uh, common in CJD and less common in autoimmune diseases and vice versa. There are certain findings in the CSF that might support one disease and not another. There are MRI findings that support one type of condition and not another. So the clinical story, certain blood tests, spinal fluid tests, brain MRI, those could all be helpful in helping us differentiate uh, and better diagnose a patient with a rapidly progressive dementia. And so talking about diagnosis, um, obviously, from what you're telling me, it's extremely difficult to diagnose. But if you were speaking to someone who either themselves or a loved one is going through experiencing some of these symptoms and they're kind of a bit lost, what would you say is their first step? What's was there a specific doctor that they should, should they go and see a neurologist immediately? Should they get a MRI? Um, what are the steps? Well, I think being seen by a neurologist first, and particularly somebody who specializes in cognitive, um, cognitive neurology or behavioral neurology, that would be my first recommendation. Sometimes it can be hard to see a behavioral neurologist because there aren't that many of us. So at least seeing a neurologist would be helpful. But usually you want to first be evaluated by a primary care physician. They need to make sure that common causes of cognitive decline, uh, which would include um, a, a, a blood test to make sure there's not an obvious infection, a systemic infection. Um, so looking, uh, doing some blood tests, looking for liver function, looking at electrolytes, looking at um, a, a blood a complete blood panel, um, a, um, and then uh, maybe a urinalysis, um, making sure there's not a, a pneumonia, particularly in an elderly person. One of the most common causes of rapid decline, I don't classify it as a rapidly progressive dementia, but a rapid decline in an older person is somebody who has some underlying neurodegenerative disease, let's say early Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, and then they have a metabolic disturbance, usually through an infection, a pneumonia or urinary tract infection, and all of a sudden they have a steep decline. I don't consider that a rapidly progressive dementia because um, the whole disease course was much longer. They had symptoms of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's for maybe years before, and now they have a sudden steep decline. So the first thing is to make sure there's not something metabolic going on that's causing a rapid decline in a person who's more susceptible to that, an older person, a person with an underlying, more slowly progressive neurodegenerative disease. And so can RPD occur at any age, presumably, if you have an underlying condition? Yes, uh, they can occur at any age. Uh, some of the autoimmune causes, uh, some of the antibodies, we have in six-month-old babies. Um, and yet we have autoimmune causes in people who are 90 years old. Uh, CJD, the youngest sporadic patient I'm aware of is 12 years old. The oldest is 96. But the peak age is, is in the early 60s. That's the most common age for CJD and probably for most rapidly progressive dementias. It's kind of in that early 60s. But you know, I have patients in their 20s, their 30s. When they're that young, 20s, 30s, often it's a, it's a genetic disorder, an inborn error of metabolism. Uh, and they, they can be a little harder to diagnose. Sometimes we have to do more complicated urine, blood, spinal fluid analyses to detect inborn errors in metabolism. And so what would you do to treat someone with, R, with any form of RPD? What is the, I mean, I know- Yeah, great question. 
It depends on, the, first, we got to find the cause. Right. We don't treat until we know the cause because a treatment for one type of disease might actually harm another. So you need to have the right cause. An example would be um, steroids. Autoimmune diseases often respond to high dose steroids. But if you have an infection, certain infections, or if you have a lymphoma and you give that patient steroids, you could really worsen the infection. If they have lymphoma, lymph the, the cells, the lymphomatous cells are degraded by steroids. They break down and are destroyed, which makes it harder to make the diagnosis because you don't have the cells, you need to make the diagnosis. So you delay diagnosing the lymphoma, you delay the treatment up for that patient lymphoma. So we don't like to treat randomly unless the patient's really declining, unless we have some idea of what the diagnosis will be, and unless we're pretty confident that the treatment won't be deleterious, won't be harmful. Yeah. Um, but the, the the key to treatment is finding out what the cause is. And sometimes there won't be a treatment. Um, CJD, Alzheimer's, uh, we don't have a treatment. We can treat some of the symptoms, but we're not generally changing the course of the disease. We're not curing the patient, at least as of today in 2021, when we're doing this interview. So is there anything kind of on the horizon that um, we can be hopeful for with regards to this? I, I am hopeful. So we're th we've already done, there have already been about four treatment trials for prion disease. Unfortunately, all of them have failed to show an improvement in survival, but some of, them, some of them have shown to have some effects in the laboratory. And maybe that those medicines in combination with other medicine, medicines might be helpful. Um, the other, um, we're also looking at um, genetic ways of treating some of these diseases now. So there's therapies for a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. That's a disease of infants, um, newborns, and usually they don't live until past the age of two. And what we're doing now is we're giving small pieces of artificial DNA into the spinal fluid. These are called antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs. And we're blocking the, um, the abnormal protein from being formed. And we, we give this um, uh, treatment through the spinal fluid, through a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap. And we do them every couple of weeks or every couple of months. And we have patients who are walking who would never have walked before, who are surviving past the two-year time point. Wow. These types of studies have now been done in animal models in prion disease. And we're thinking about doing these in hopefully the next, year or two maybe, unknown yet, in, in humans with prion disease. Uh, it's possible. So uh, I'm optimistic uh, about some of these tr treatments. For Alzheimer's disease, there have been more than 40 medic medication trials that have all failed. But some of them, when you do secondary analyses, look like there might be sub-cohorts that might respond to treatments better than others. So I'm optimistic about those. And then there are new types of treatments that we're looking at for some of the neurodegenerative diseases that might hold promise as well. Uh, and then there are viral vectors for gene therapy where we're actually injecting or putting in uh, new genes into the brain um, to help ameliorate the either block the abnormal process that's going on or to replenish a gene that's um, deficient, that's too low by um, allowing, by supplanting that. So there are lots of things going on now. Um, I did my PhD 30 years ago on human gene therapy, and now I'm actually in the clinic applying the techniques from what my PhD was on three decades ago. So there can be a long time course between what we do in the lab and what gets to the patients in clinic. Um, but I'm more and more hopeful um, all the time. Well, that's, I think that's probably a good note to end it on. We did have one question here um, in the comments. You kind of touched on this earlier, but which autoimmune diseases can cause rapid onset dementia? Or is it kind of well many different kinds? No, it's a great question. So usually the systemic autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, those usually do not cause rapidly progressive dementia. So the systemic rheumatologic diseases, Sjogren's, 
those things, there have been case reports of those causing it, but I even doubt some of those case reports. Um, um, there might be some cases, but the vast majority of autoimmune causes of rapidly progressive dementia are antibody mediated causes. Um, and those would include LGI-1 encephalitis, CASPER-2, NMDA receptor, AMPA receptor. So these are proteins that are either uh, part of the receptor on nerve cells, uh, or sometimes they're on the surface of nerve cells, sometimes they're in the synapse, the connection between two adjoining nerve cells, the synapse. Sometimes they're inside the cell. Um, there are proteins or targets inside the cell and antibodies against those can lead to various neurological syndromes, seizures, neuropathies, uh, death of sensory nerve cells, um, general um, blockade of certain neurotransmitters, uh, and, and which are distributed in different parts of the brain, uh, such as the MMDA receptor. Uh, and those can lead to various neurologic syndromes, including encephalopathy or a form of rapidly progressive dementia. And many of those are very treatable, um, somewhere 80% uh, or more uh, re recovery. Wow. Okay, well, that, that, that's a little helpful. Um, in conjunction with what you were saying earlier, but is there anything you feel I've missed that you'd like to touch on? Maybe a misconception or? No, I, I think we've addressed many of the things. It's, you know, in a short 30-minute uh, uh, conversation, it's hard to capture everything. Absolutely. But I think in the time we've had, uh, I think we've really touched on the key points in a very nice way. I agree. I couldn't agree more. And you've been um, extremely thorough and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. For more information on upcoming interviews, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at beingpatient.com. That's B-E-I-N-G-P-A-T-I-E-N-T.com. And send us any feedback you may have, whether it's someone you want us to interview or any comment about our podcast series. You can do so by emailing info at beingpatient.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm Deborah Kahn.